is, the question might be, what on earth is an astroimager? And this is an example of the sort of thing an astroimager does. And uh, there was one time two astroimagers, and they're sitting in a room busily processing the night's image one, and a psychiatrist comes into the room. <laughs> and he looks at them and he says, well, what are you guys doing here? And one of them sitting in front of the computer just typing away, trying to make the oxygen show different than the sulfur and all that kind of a thing. And the, and the second one is just hanging by his legs upside down from the ceiling. And so the psychiatrist asked the first one, well, uh, um, well I can kind of see what you're doing, but what's your friend doing? He's, and the guy says, well, uh, he's crazy. He thinks he's a light bulb. <laughs> and they said, well, you know, uh, maybe you better get your friend to come down because his legs are getting blue and his face is getting red. And the answer was, what, and work in the dark? <laughs> but, but in reality, we do work in the dark. And what, what I wanted to show you here is that when I was a, a wee lad, for reasons that are difficult to recall, because you can't believe your memory would exist for the back, because the act of remembering rewrites the memory. Well, what I do remember was something big. Now, this was the big telescope that followed Lonio's here. And this is at Perkin uh, now, up in Ohio. And this is twice the size of the telescope that Rob shows you with him standing next to. So when I was a wee lad, I was probably about this tall. <laughs> And I walk into a room, and there's this thing. And uh, I was very, very impressed. And I was so impressed that later I got on my bicycle and pedaled up the hill and went right up to the door. And <laughs> Mr. Shotland answered the door, and he said, oh, you want to come see the telescope again, don't you? And so I said, yes. And in we walked. And he took time to show it to me. At one point, I actually did look through it. Now, um, What's the neatest thing about astronomy as a hobby? And it's really what Big Mike did with me at a very early age, for reasons I have no understanding why I got there. But it's outreach, and that's to kids. And an example in my personal life, thinking about that, I was living in Cary, and I had a 10-inch telescope that's easy to use sitting on the ground. It's called a Dobsonian. And there are little kids in the neighborhood. They're at perfect age. They're like 8 to 10 years old. And they come wandering around, and they wonder, what's this? And so I show it to them and teach them how to use it. It's very simple. You can just push it and look and push it and look. And they thought that was really cool. So the habit became that any time there was a good evening with you know, no chance of bad weather, I would just leave it out in front of the garage and leave it out. And the kids would come around and use it whenever they wished. And so they would find things, and they would knock on the door and ask what it was. And this went on for some months, actually. So finally one night, I'm upstairs in the, in the upstairs den, and I hear laughter outside. And I look outside, and there's only guys. And the guys are sitting there, and they're looking through the telescope, and it's not pointing this way. <laughs> it's pointing this way. And across the street was the upstairs bedroom window of the little, of two of the sisters of the little girls. And they're walking like Egyptians back and forth across the window while the boys are looking at it with the scope. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, are any of their father's lawyers? <laughs> but anyway, the idea is outreach. It's really important. Now, did that move? Come on, move. Oh, what's that? I have no idea. Well, telescope basics. The bigger the scope, the smaller the star. The bigger the scope, the more you see. That's pretty simple, isn't it? So here's an example of looking at the sky with a very small scope. This is about a three and a half inch scope. Points for many hours at a part of the sky in Taurus where there's three galaxies. What's interesting about those galaxies is the light from them left to come to our eyes about the time the dinosaurs were going extinct. So if you take a telescope that's twice the size of this one and look at just one of them, now you see it's in more detail, but you see less of the sky because it's a smaller field of view. Now this is really a fascinating thing for a small 8-inch 
thing because you can barely see a little trail here and a little trail here that's running right here. If you really look at it in high resolution, what you find that it is, is the remnant trail of a collision of a galaxy that happened to run through that galaxy four billion years ago. Okay? So in essence, telescopes are time machines. Now the other basics of telescopes is that the light gathering is the size of the diameter. And your eyes are in little, little itty bitty things. But with our eyes, we don't do bad. Okay? Now I put this picture up, photograph up, because it's by a friend who's a fellow imager, Ivan Ong. He was in Singapore. And he set his camera on a tripod and he's waiting for the moon to come up here over Singapore River. And while he's waiting, this lovely couple just strolls into the picture. Mm -hmm. So he says, why not? So he takes the picture. So it's really sort of a, a salient feature of being an amateur <clears throat> imager is you have to be an opportunist. You have to take what the sky gives you, and if it's mm -hmm. something different, you take that and you enjoy it. So mostly you spend time waiting for the sun to go down and looking at beautiful clouds and hoping they're going to go away. <laughs> <laughs> but eventually they do go away. And the reason I included this image here is that this is a very small telescope. This is three inches, but it's 20 hours of total accumulation of light. This image was acquired from a little telescope on my patio in Loveland, Colorado, while I'm here in Martinsville, Virginia, visiting my mom and dad. We might have been sipping bourbon at the time, who knows? <laughs> no, but in any, any case, the internet is a wondrous thing. And so the idea of having automation and things far away, you don't have to be out in the cold. That's a tremendous advance. Well, there are lots of kinds of telescopes. This is boring stuff, right? In other words, you have a refractor where you've got a lens in the front. If you look at two lenses, that has four optical surfaces. A quality one will have three lenses, so that's six optical surfaces. Each of them have to be perfect. It makes them expensive. But the other problem with a scope like this is that this lens can only be so large before it reaches the point when you point it up at the sky. Remember pictures of ancient Roman buildings and the beautiful windows that still survive and how the windows have poured down? Glass is a fluid and the lenses actually distort from gravity. So they're limited in how big they can be and how big the buildings they can be that can house them. But as Rob said, in the 1660s, a rather clever guy named Isaac Newton came up with the idea of a reflecting telescope. And what was cool about it is it has one optical surface. It's the front, and that's polished. Because it's one optical surface, the back of this mirror can be supported and it can be made large. And so, big is big. Those are people, wow. right? This is a big telescope. Again, the mount points at our pole. This is Mount Palomar at about the time that it was being commissioned. This is Mount Palomar today. It hadn't changed a lot. Here we go, there's Lodios. Schmidt camera. Again, another diagram of this. And what's really ironic about this is that the largest Schmidt camera on the planet is in Palomar Observatory. It's a, it's a four foot Schmidt photographic instrument. You see it scaled to human people sitting there. Lodios is half that size. It's a dramatic, unbelievable instrument to own privately. What makes it powerful is that it's fast optically. The film surface or detectors here relative to the mirror, so it makes it F2. It gathers light like nothing else imaginable. Now, nothing before or since is better than Lonios for finding near-Earth objects. Why? It's not huge. It's, it's a little smaller, it covers a wider field of view. So when you want to survey the sky, you can see more at once. And, and instead of having to take a mosaic of 10 images, you might get it all in one. It's tremendous. So I often have, I have thought to myself, what prompted him to buy this instrument? And in my, in my own thing, I'm thinking, you know what? If he'd still been in Russia, 
In 1908, when Tunguska hit, you would have heard it. No question about it. It was heard thousands of miles away. Okay? Again, 1913, Chelyabinsk. This, this guy came through, much smaller than that. But if this asteroid had come in downward instead of at an angle, its effect would have been like the largest hydrogen bomb ever detonated mm. on, that city, on that city. So these are serious, and the idea of doing survey work is, is tremendous. Now, another thing struck by fancy, and that is in December 1916, a gentleman we all sort of vaguely know about published his theory of relativity. And that was, this, that was the year the Big Bike came to Virginia. And there's some really amazing thoughts in this. And one is what we all know, E equal MC squared, be afraid, energy and matter are the same thing. The other thing that's harder to grip, that is, as you travel faster, time really slows down. That's a, that's a concept that's difficult. That's part of the relativity thing. And the other part that's critical that separated him from Isaac Newton and the concept of gravity is that matter distorts the very fabric of space. This changed everything. Now, there's a wonderful book, if you want to read more about this, Coming of Age of the Milky Way by Timothy Ferris. It's sort of a nice story of the, of the journey of people's understanding of our place in the cosmos. It's a fantastic read to go through. Now, again, our eyes do a pretty good job. Okay? This is a photograph of a lake in Italy at sunrise. There's a couple of planets here. Now, imagine instead that here is a quarter moon rather than Venus and uh, Jupiter. In the 1300s in India, while they were busy doing things like inventing trigonometry, they made, an, they made observations of the moon as a quarter moon, as a right triangle, they measured the angle of the sun to the moon under those conditions, knowing that Earth is the other part. It's one-seventh of a degree. So the sign of one-seventh of a degree means that that is 400 to 1. So it means the sun is 400 times further than the Earth than is the sun. This was in the 1300s in India. Guess what? It's exactly right. So. People were fairly clever. Now, again, thinking about gravity. Personally, I'm not able to deal with the mathematical aspects of it, although it is a simple equation. But I really rather think of it like this, and more in po poetic terms. So, something always brings me back to you, it never takes too long. That's gravity. Another is, you hold me without touch, you keep me without chains. That, in essence, is what, what gravity is. But as Newton described it, it was an equation. And the equation reads, the mass of one object times the mass of the other object divided by the distance between them squared defines the force of gravity with this little thing called g. He didn't know what it was. He just knew it had to be there to make it fit. So it was a big deal to find out what is g. A hundred years later, a minister, a geologist named John Mitchell. Ministers were the, ed the best educated scientists in, like, Europe in this particular part of time because they could read, they could write, and they also had free time. They weren't shoveling in coal, <laughs> right? So they could think about these things. So he thought about this, and he lived in Scotland, and he lived next to a great big mountain. And he said, you know what? If only I could weigh that mountain. I could hang from my parlor in my house a great big copper ball. And if I could measure how much the copper ball leans toward the mountain, I'd know the mass of the ball, I'd know the mass of the mountain, and I could calculate G. Nobody could do it. It's 100 years of people <clears throat> worried about it. Well, he did it. And in the process of doing so, he invented topographical maps to weigh the mountain. And he got the answer right. His wife was not pleased. <laughs> <laughs> now, so as we've gone through, like this sort of sums up, you know, our understanding as we become self-conscious. 
you know, as, you know, it's like eat, survive, reproduce. It's kind of been what it's been about. And now it's like the question is, what's it all about? You know, and we think we're getting clever, but in fact, you think about the Neanderthals looking at the wonder of the dark sky, wondering what's it all about. And now here we are today, sitting in front of our massive instruments, wondering, asking the same questions. So the real thing is that the more we learn, the more we learn that we do not know, which is, which is sort of an endless tale. Now we're getting, we're getting closer to the end. Now, the other concept that's hard for us to grasp, that really grew of an understanding from Einstein's work in gravity and all, is, you know, you're only 10 minutes late. Do you realize how far the universe has expanded in that time? And it is a lot. The other one, from a, from a higher perch, is it was a lot easier to keep an eye on things before the Big Bang. Everything was all in one place. <laughs> so you can take a look at a small galaxy that's very close to us. Again, this is with maybe a 200 millimeter telescope from the patio. And it's close. It's only, its light is only, takes only 21 million years to get here. And of course, light goes around the Earth seven times in one second. So you get a sense of how big, big it is. This thing is close. But its stars tell us that it's racing away at a half a million miles an hour. That's what the expansion of the universe is really kind of about. And how you do it, you do it with uh, uh, certain kinds of stars get brighter and dimmer on a, on a specific uh, rate of time, depending on how bright they are absolutely. Problem is, there's dust everywhere. Our galaxy is a dusty place. So here's a nice galaxy that's really close to us and it should be truly beautiful, but you see it's faint and obscure. It's because we're viewing it through dust. So astronomers are clever people and they lean back again on Isaac Newton, who came up with the first idea of a prism <coughs> to spread, spread light into a, uh, um, a rainbow, if you will. And other people said, you know, if you put it with a little tiny slit, you can see little black lines that correspond to the atoms. And like a train that goes by at a high rate of speed and honks his horn, this one particular train was full of drunken cowboys coming back from a rodeo <laughs> in, in Wyoming. You hear the, tr the tone of the whistle get lower. It's a Doppler effect. If it's coming towards you, it gets higher. Same thing happens with light. It gets shifted toward the blue or toward the red that the object is coming towards you or going away. So that's how these things are known. Now, this is a galaxy that's really close to us. And to me, it's amazing how much detail you can see in, in an actual galaxy that's three million light years away. You can see all kinds, you can actually see clusters of stars. And to me, it's rather interesting that there's sort of a pinkish, glowy thing up here, right? This one's coming toward us at 62,000 miles an hour, so it would be afraid. <laughs> and what is it? If you turn a telescope, a much smaller telescope, toward the next spiral arm out from us, you see Orion. And the Orion sword is a little fuzzy star right in the center. If you look at that and image it, you see Orion's nebula. And what is this? It's a star factory. This is, this is an immense object where stars are being born all the time. Now, I mentioned it was coming at us at 62,000 miles an hour, and why? And the answer is, this big behemoth, the Andromeda galaxy, which you can see with your naked eye, is two, a little over two million light years away, and its gravity is so powerful, its attraction, it's, it's attracting that of the first one spiral and our Milky Way, and we're all racing together to have a great big garden party about four billion years from now. And when four billion years come, this is what's going to happen. Our galaxies are going to collide. You don't, you would think it would be a bad thing, but in actual fact, even though these look dense, it's only because we're far away and there's the integrated light of it all. In actual fact, stars will probably never even know. They'll just swirl around each other. So here is the object that I was shown by Big Mike with this telescope. 
And this is the only surviving photograph of me looking through this telescope. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, you look far and galaxies are all shapes and sizes, right? And here's a beautiful, beautiful one, it's edge on. And we can't see it on this screen. You need, you need to see the full digital resolution. This is like one eighth of the real resolution of the image. But there are over 80 galaxies visible in this small image. So our universe is a really busy, crowded place. Now, there is an image that has a sort of a this didn't render well with the projector, but there's a sort of a sombrero looking thing. There's a bright ball with a little dust cloud through the middle of it. And that was taken with an 80 millimeter telescope. So if you decide to use more technology and instead point a $2.5 billion telescope at it, you see something like this. So this is Hubble. And this is an astounding image and certainly the thing that's totally sobering is that even at one pixel of the full high resolution image of this, and this is one tenth the resolution of the real image, mind you, our entire solar system is swallowed up in that one pixel. Okay? Now, other things. Here is the $700 Newtonian from the patio, and there is Hubble pointing <laughs> at the remnant of a supernova in 1054, which caused people to fall over and cry and everything because suddenly a star was visible bright at noon. So the question becomes, why bother, right? In other words, you can, uh, why bother to, t well, first thing is, it's fun to tinker with this stuff and make it work. I got that from my dad. That's the tinker factor. That's why you do the hobby. That's one big thing. But the other thing is this quote, and I really love it. That is, the tragedy of life doesn't lie in not reaching your goal. The tragedy lies in having no goal to reach. It is, isn't a calamity to die with dreams unfulfilled, but it is a calamity not to dream. It is not disgrace to not reach the stars, but it is disgrace to have no stars to reach for. So I thought that was a beautiful quote by Benjamin E. Mays. And again, wherever you look, there's stars. Stars, stars, stars. Millions of stars in a tiny package. You can see that with your binoculars. There are red things, right? These red things are where stars are being born. The glow of red is from the ionization of hydrogen. Here's a famous kind of red thing. This one I think I took in Texas. Here's the Horsehead Nebula. It's just a cloud of dust that's in front of a, of a bright nebula. This is called the Flame Nebula because it looks like a flame. The only thing in this picture that is visible, even with binoculars, is that star and that star. There are blue things. These are reflection rather than emission of gas. This is a bright star is reflecting. And when they do so, you see the blue things. I particularly love the blue things. I find them just intriguing and gorgeous. And I like all the little scary stuff that flies through it. And there's really scary things. People say this looks like a witch head. It's called the witch head nebula. And it's blue. And there are also blue and red things. They're the Triffid Nebula. So it's a combination of many things. And so there's uh, a no shortage of things far away and really nearby to do it. But most of all, there are far things, okay? So here's an image of, um, it's called the Deer Lake Group. It was discovered by some guy who liked to go to a meadow where deer hung out. There's a galaxy whose light traveled, has traveled since the age of the dinosaurs to get here. And we can see it in fair detail. And there's lots of other galaxies all over. But what I draw your attention to is there's a little group of galaxies here. There's five of them. They're called Stefan's Quintet. And the reddish ones of those, that is nearly half a billion <coughs> light years away. And again, and I mentioned Earth goes around the Earth seven times in a second. 
So the sense of the scale of things is hard to understand. And finally, at last, with these time machines called telescopes, we can do the chemistry in the sky. So here's an image taken where sulfur is red, oxygen is blue, and hydrogen is green. So we can actually look and understand the chemistry. And again, summing up what Mike Shotland did, it says, every man and woman is bored to the world to do something unique and something distinctive. And if he or she does not do it, it will never be done. And I find it really rather interesting that Benjamin Mays is essentially the same generation as Big Mike. Born 1894, died 1984. And the last comment I would say, closing thought. Astronomers hate daylight saving. <laughs> and so the caption reads, Remember, when the daylight saving times end, we have to give everything a slight turn. To <laughs> and so with that, I want to thank you and leave you with the notion that really beauty is more in how you look <clears throat> rather than in where you gaze. And it was my honor to be here.